The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. Malika Fitzhugh, who goes by Mel, is a contemporary composer with a flair for historical instruments. The Harvard Radcliffe and Bard-trained musician enjoys playing and composing for historical instruments, including Renaissance and Baroque recorders, viols, harpsichord, and organ. She also plays a mind-boggling list of instruments, violin, viola, cello, double bass, acoustic guitar, and bass, recorders, flute, clarinet, saxophone, trumpet, and a variety of hand percussion instruments. As an instrumentalist, Malika Fitzhugh's performances span many genres, including membership in Quilisma Consort, which plays music from the 14th through 16th centuries. Mel Fitzhugh joins me via Zoom to chat about her remarkable career. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So pandemic is tough on everyone, and there are many special challenges for musicians. So how how are you doing? Actually, I'm doing well. Um, My friend from college has let me use her basement guest room to do Wi-Fi and teach and such. So we had the, uh, because both of us live alone, we had the ability to to be together during this entire year. Um, And she has a dog. (laughs) So (laughs) have to shout out Cassie, the 12 year old golden retriever. (laughs) Who's lovely. And uh, so it's been it's actually been pretty good. I miss I miss rehearsing with people, but I have Zoom calls and Google Meet calls with most of my ensembles on a weekly basis just to check in, see how we're doing and and such. And I've been doing a lot of composing during this time. So there is that. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I know that a number of musicians I've spoken with have have kind of said the same thing, like some of the things that they have maybe put off or didn't necessarily have as much consolidated time um, to devote to things like composing or maybe writing papers and books that they wanted to write. You know, they've, mm-hmm. they've really used that time to, you know, to redirect their creativity. So that's great. Yes, absolutely. Great. That's been, I guess, the, a silver lining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're such a versatile musician. And I, I, I want to Go back to the beginning and find out what was your initial introduction into music? You know, what was your first instrument and how old were you? Well, I was five, uh, begging my grandmother and my mother to get me a guitar because I wanted to be just like Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry. Oh. And I finally got a guitar for my sixth birthday. Wow. And they took me to Fredericksburg, Virginia to, uh, I think it was Robertson's Music. And I studied classical guitar for three years. Wow. Wow. Hans Brennan. It was great. I learned Schubert, uh, no, Schumann, Schumann and Bartok, and of course, all of the great finger picking styles of the 70s, wow. the late 70s. Wow. So I was going to say, yeah, so you end up, you ask for a guitar to, to be like Elvis and Chuck Berry, and you end up playing Schumann and Bartok. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great thing. I, to this day, I still love Bartok and, and Schumann. Wow. And, how, uh, how does a six year old get her arms and hands around a well, guitar? I've always been tall. Uh, I've been this height, five ten three quarters, since I was ten. Wow. So I know that when I was eight, I was my grandmother's height at five four. So when I was six, I was probably over f- close to five feet tall. Wow. So um, the first guitar I, I had was a three quarter size guitar. Wow. Mm-hmm. But then when I was seven, I I still have that full size guitar. That that's a Yamaha. It's all red flamey and, <laughs> and wow. such but i still have that guitar from when i was seven the full-size guitar wow. so wow. because i've always been tall and long long-armed yeah 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 wow so then how did you add on all these other instruments how did how did that happen well in third grade so kindergarten is when i started guitar third grade i got to participate in special music and in stafford virginia which is where i grew up um not everybody had the opportunity to learn recorder I guess everybody in all the schools nowadays in third or fourth grade learn recorder, but special music program, we got to play for the PTA, I remember. I think it was something like 
uh, he's got the whole world in his hands or something, or cross, hot cross buns. But we played, I, so I learned the recorder in third grade. Um, fifth grade, had the opportunity to join the orchestra. So I learned viola because I did not like the high E string of the violin. <laughs> Everybody else was flocking to the violin. I'm like, no! But so I, I chose the viola because it was still a shoulder held instrument. So it was still portable, but did not have that E string shrieking in the hands of yeah. the uninitiated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I played that throughout middle school, got to high school, uh, joined the band um, playing percussion. Because it turns out in public school, they didn't teach percussionists how to hear notes. So um, the band director was desperate for somebody who could play timpani, could tune the drums, who could tell the difference between a C and a, and a D, which the percussionists that were coming into the school, they were completely tone deaf. Amazing, talented percussionists, you know, but apparently just couldn't differentiate pitch because they had never been taught wow. to differentiate pitch. Wow. So that's when I started in the band. And then I had lots of friends who were willing to teach me their instruments. So I learned clarinet and saxophone once I joined the band. And of course, I um, played different of the string instruments, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the entire time. Yeah. But yeah. I always gravitated to the viola because it just had that beautiful, warm tone and yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. And there were fewer people playing it. So... In competitions, I always got to be first or second chair. Oh, good <laughs> in strategy. Yeah. Good, good business sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when did you start composing? You know, was that in high school? Yeah, yeah. in high school. And what, what were some of your first compositions like? Uh, very rudimentary, but a lot of fun. Um, one of the first things I ever did was an arrangement of the Young and Restless theme from my middle school or my middle school string orchestra. Oh, wow. That was a lot of fun. Mrs. Ross let me get, let me pass out parts and we all played oh, it. And it was very exciting. Wow. Were you a young uh, and restless fan watcher? Is... Well, my grandmother was very into her stories. As she, you know, being a Southern wife, she, she called them her stories. And farm work would happen as I grew up on a farm. Farm work would happen in the morning. And then her stories would happen in the afternoon during the summer. So young and the restless, all my children... General Hospital <laughs> were all there were no there were no cartoons for me. There was oh, just wow. the the soap operas. So wow. that theme was one of the one of the things that stuck in my brain and formative melody. <laughs> yeah. So so were your mom or grandmother were either of them musicians as well? Well, my grandmother she was a Southern Baptist deaconess, so she sang. Mm -hmm. um, I think that before she became a deaconess, probably she'd been in the choir. But my mother was a concert pianist and also played piano for a church choir. So, ah, and nope. my uncle Verdi, I swear, when I was younger, I swear he played banjo and harmonica. But and he might have been the one to blame for me being obsessed with Chuck Berry and um, Elvis Presley yeah. because my mother was more into like my grandmother and my mother. They mostly listened to like Mahalia Jackson, you know, some the gospel stars and right, 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 and right. such. And my mother had this piano bench full of like Rachmaninoff and uh -huh. the Bartok Beaker Cosmos, which is how I taught myself piano when I was in high school and <gasps> such. But wow. So you do you have perfect pitch? I do not. Not even slightly. Oh, no. OK. So, yeah, I, I mean, good relative pitch, but yeah. not perfect pitch, which I think is an advantage because I can play in any temperament, any um, tuning like 415, 440, 465 doesn't mm -hmm. matter. As long as I know what the A is, right. I can figure out how things are supposed to sound in relation. Yeah. So now, uh, why don't you explain what that means? Because not uh, not everyone necessarily knows that. And, and you know, that that's also a skill that not a lot of musicians necessarily have to find simply because they don't necessarily bounce right. back and forth between modern and historical instruments as you do. So, <laughs> you know, there are different temperaments and different, you know, pitches that are used based on whether you're playing in historical, you know, in a, a, an historical instrument or a modern instrument. So you want yes, to want to give the thumbnail well, sketch? Most instruments today are equal temperament, meaning the distance between each half step is the same. So that means that a piano can play in any key at any time. You can modulate from C sharp minor to D major without any kerfluffles or D flat major to C major without any troubles. 
Um, in historically, um, when pitch was more uh, centered around the relationship between uh, notes, so the ratios, you know, that what was it, three to two is um, a fifth, I think, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the distance between half steps was a little bit wonkier. Mm -hmm. And so pure fifths and pure thirds sound differently in different temperaments, the just intonation or well, t or well tempered or um, what is the one? Mean tone. Mm, yeah. Mean tone is the one that um, my ensemble, the Quilisma Qu Consort, our recorders are mean tone. So you can get these pure ringier fifths and such than you can in, because the fifth is slightly squashed in equal temperament because the half steps are the same. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a different way of listening, a different way of hearing um, the relationship between notes, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And in Baroque period, I'm told, I wasn't there, so I don't know for sure, but I'm told that A, it was closer to 415, meaning 415 hertz, um, as opposed to today, it's been settled into a brighter, more energized 440. So it's because the, the an open A string, when it's tuned to 440, actually vibrates faster than an open A strings tuned to 415. I think that 415 sounds chocolatier. Like it just has this chocolatey sound to it. Hmm. So I love playing in 415. I love that expression, chocolatey. And it kind <laughs> of explains my a little bit of the answer to my next question, which is the, one of the things that I find so exciting and so fascinating about your compositions is your use of these historical instruments in a contemporary musical language. So mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to do that? Well, I loving playing um, historical uh, instruments that were, you know, I actually, obviously, I've never actually played an instrument from 1570, but I've played reproductions, right. and it's just so exciting. The ta the tone of it, the timbre, um, is it's different to play an instrument that's based like a vihuela is. It looks like a guitar, um, it, you know, from the uninitiated, you look at it, it's like, oh, a string instrument that's shaped like this. Ah, oh, it's a guitar, and you play it by plucking. Oh, it's a, but the timbre of it is so different probably because it has gut strings or the inner construction that i know nothing about since i'm not a woodworker but it just the it settles on the ear differently mm -hmm. um i'm not going to say one is more pleasant than the other but it's different and it's exciting to me yeah. and also like i said um i had an experience a couple of years ago well at this point it's i think it was like 2014 so many years ago where uh, a local recorder player, Aldo Abreu, and um, Barrett Strong, a local guitar player, had agreed to play a piece that I'd written. And, you know, we had met at his house and they played through the entire thing and it was great and fantastic. And he's like, oh, well, have you thought about doing it in Baroque pitch? And so he got out his 415 soprano recorder mm -hmm. and she tuned down to 415 and they played it and it was like, oh, <gasps> Same notes, same players, same tempi. Um, wow. He had a different instrument, but you know, same professional quality instrument, but it just sounded so warmer and so more chocolatey. That's <laughs> the only way I can describe it. And so that's when I really started writing specifically for for historical instruments. You know, it's if I have a chance to get a cellist to play a piece or I have a chance to have a viola da gambas play a piece, a bass viola da gamba, I'm going to go for the viola da gamba because that, the timbre of it. I mean, 440 is bright and wonderful and exciting. And that's why orchestras, I think in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere in the annals of time, they decided in Europe and in, in the US to, to settle on that being tuning pitch because mm -hmm. it's bright, it fills halls, it's, it's very exciting. But I like that more intimate, um, little bit darker chocolatey sound of the 415 yeah. it is more it is it's great for chamber music for for playing things that are intimate and in a smaller space instead of a big concert hall so sure sure and i think you know i, I think now even a lot of uh, major orchestras are even bumping up the pitch yeah like 443 442 443 yeah i think the bso was 441 or 442 mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. But. And it's so interesting, you know, you raise a really good point, too, about chamber music. I mean, these instruments are more intimate. They don't project in the same way that modern instruments do, not only right. because of the pitch and tuning, but simply because of the construction and, and whatnot. Right. And, and they are, they are, they do have a more intimate sound to them and, and are much more suited to chamber music and, um, and that sort of blend between the instruments. Yes, blend. Yeah. It's very, very wonderful to have instruments that are just soaking each other's sound mm -hmm. together. And and do you find, like, you know, so for example, there would have been, um, um, you know, like broken consorts or whatever. Do you find that you approach combining instruments in a similar way that they might have in those days? Or are you just sort of, you're just interested in the timbres of the musicians and you sort of combine Mostly them? Mostly just interested in the timbres and mm -hmm. combining. I mean, sometimes I will ha just do for a, a single consort, like I've, I've done pieces for the Boston Recorder Orchestra, which is all match Levirgi recorder, Renaissance style recorder instruments. And that's great fun having that enormous breadth of sound when you have the contrabass of, of all the way up to the Sopranino. Right, right. Recorders and, and, and everyone breathing together and oh, glorious, fantastic. Yeah. But I also like combining harpsichord and, you know, viola da gamba and recorder or continue organ and kirtle and um sopranino <laughs> recorder why not yeah yeah just yeah. just because the timbre the way they blend together and and such and yeah. the different colors you can have yeah and it's been interesting to see too i think um as some of these older instruments these historical instruments have become more um taught and become more common uh, more common than they were anyway over the years i mean i've been doing sunday baroque for a few decades now and mm -hmm. you know i've seen sort of the quality of performance has really improved and, and increased mm -hmm. and so the ability to play virtuosic licks on instruments that used to be a little bit more difficult you know i mean the, the, the yes. level of, of musicianship has really improved um, greatly so Indeed, it yes. sort of pushes the limits of what you can write as a composer mm -hmm. um so I so getting into composing, you know, composers, of course, write, you know, you write on your own as well. But sometimes you get commissions and I know you've received commissions. So how do you start to compose something? I mean, you, know, do you, you sit down with this blank um, page and, you know, like if you get a commission, for example, how much input do you get about what the final product should be? And, and you know, like where do you start? Literally, what is the first thing you put down on that on that piece of paper? Or well, it depends screen? on who's commissioning, because sometimes it if it's a vocalist <clears throat> and they have, you know, they have a vocal range. So that's going to be a constraint that mm -hmm. I, I, I welcome constraints really. Um, and if they've chosen a text, like a few years ago, I had a, for my um, recorder ensemble, we had a guest tenor singer mm -hmm. in, in with us. And he wanted to do a piece based on these um, Aztec poems of lamentation. <laughs> In, translated into English, but still there were Noahatl city names. <laughs> wow. Really? Elisha, you want to <laughs> sing Noah? All right. <laughs> We're just going to go with that. So so I started exploring, you know, the, the sound of the human voice with tenor recorders, tenor, tenors and tenors, and had dissonances and unisons and just ex exploring these things. Uh, a fair amount of dissonance because these were poems of lamentation of destruction of cities by mm -hmm. the Spaniards and mm -hmm. and such um, but other times like I've been participating in Patricia Abreu's uh, new music for new musicians series so I'll get with her students and ask them well what do you like to play what kinds of things do you like to play on the piano what what feels easy what do your fingers like to do and I'll start with some things that imitate the, the pieces that they like to play Oh. so that they're having fun but they're doing something new and I'll do something different with it like one student really liked ragtime so I did a piece that was vaguely raggish you know had that sort of striding bass but in 7-8 instead of in 2-4 so yeah. yeah a little twist a little drama a little bit. <laughs> yeah it was very exciting so it really depends um this past year I had been writing pieces for solo instruments that were twists on uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's mm. novel titles. Like I did Love in the Time of COVID-19, oh. um, The Winter of Recudescence, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
what was that? Oh, 100 years, 100 days of solitude. Yeah. And I had a third. Oh, Chronicle of a Pandemic Foretold. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. That's great. I had all these different things that. So is the process sort of similar to someone who's a writer where you just like, you know, are you disciplined in that way where you just sort of sit down every day or week or whatever and just say, I'm going to devote X number of hours to composing music and I'll see what comes out? Rarely. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Most of the time things come to me in dream uh-huh. and sometimes in the middle of the night I'll sit up and I'll either type into my BlackBerry. Yes, I still have a BlackBerry. Wow. <laughs> I love a keyboard that I could feel. Uh, I'll sort of, because I use Lily Pond for making scores or making PDFs. Okay. So I can just type Lily Pond code in uh-huh. the middle of the night into my BlackBerry for the, for the pitches and rhythms that, uh, of what I've just had in a dream or sometimes I'll write it in, in the dark. Mm-hmm. And then I have no idea what I was writing in the next morning. So yes, usually I just grab my BlackBerry because that's wow. safer. Wow, wow. And I'll yeah. write things down that I hear in my head. And, uh-huh, uh-huh. and sometimes sometimes it'll make it into a piece, sometimes it doesn't. But I have these little scraps of, of melody, scraps of rhythm, rhythmic material, melodic material, whatever, yeah. that I can take and, yeah. and put into a piece. So teaching is a really important part of your musical life, too. You alluded a little bit to it before. What do you love about teaching and, and, you know, and how have you adapted to that during COVID? Well, I've been doing it all online via Zoom, whatever the whatever the student wants to use. If they want to use Zoom, Skype, Google Meet, Google Hangout, whatever, I will connect with them in that way. Mm -hmm. And um the the main thing that I like to teach or pass on to students is a joy in music, mm. having fun with music, and also uh, decent technique. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But and- the most important thing is the joy of music. So if they are starting on violin and they hit a wall or something, well, I'm okay with them trying some piano or mm. A different instrument if they you know want to if they've been playing piano all their life but they want to start playing with their friends uh sure well we can learn some guitar too why not yeah 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 so are you finding you know obviously there are some downsides to uh having to teach um you know long distance online yeah. but I, this is terrible <laughs> yeah yeah I, and I've, I've spoken to a couple of uh, music teachers who have said that there were these unexpected advantages. For example, one um, pianist said that he was now aware of the kind of instruments that his students have at home mm-hmm. that he wouldn't mm-hmm. necessarily have even thought to ask about before. Right. You know, So there's a little bit of an advantage of now being able to see kind of what they have to contend with and, and what kind of an instrument and maybe advise the family about, you know, upgrading to another instrument. So have you found any any advantages amongst amongst the disadvantages of having to teach online? Well, I mostly taught privately and I was going into people's homes anyway, so I mostly see what they had to contend with. Right. So that wasn't uh, a distinct advantage. But what I do enjoy is not having to cut off people. Mm. You know, I am terrible with time. I admit it freely. So some of my half hour lessons end up being 45 minutes, <laughs> but it, it gives us the chance to just explore a topic and not have to worry about, oh, I have somebody coming in, you know, so if, if, if somebody arrived five minutes late, I would have to cut them off at, you know, two to the hour to allow them to, you know, um, pack up their stuff and and leave. Or I had to go because I had to get in my car and drive to another house. So just having the the leisureliness of being able to explore whatever topic. And, you know, they, my students feel like they can contact me outside of lessons if they have questions or if they're hitting Mm -hmm. a wall in their practice. Mm -hmm. You can have a quick, oh, let's just, uh, let's just, you know, connect. I have five minutes. Let's look at what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Give some advice and go. So yeah, that's yeah. been nice. Yeah, yeah. And I love the idea too that you know through this time, music is so important and it, and it's something that does bring us together. And so to be able to continue that and to be able to continue to connect with your students, I think is really more important. Very than important. Ever. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And 
for you to connect with them as well. <laughs> um, so now you were a, comp- a composer in residence for the March 2021 Virtual Women Composers Festival of Hartford. Would you talk about that a little bit? I, I was not even familiar with this festival, and, and I would love to know about you know what your experience was like and what was some of the music celebrated there. Well, uh, so it was different this year because it was the first virtual. It, I was supposed to be 2020. 2020 ceased to exist. Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't know if my experience is anything like the experience of um, composers in residence for that festival before because I was supposed to have gone into schools and talked about composition and mm-hmm. and playing music, but that none of that got to happen mm-hmm. at all. So it was mostly just you know i got finally had my string quartet that i wrote in 2019 oh. performed that was very exciting for me i have seven string quartets only at this point two of them have been performed wow. so I'm trying to get those get those done um but it was great because uh patricia Breu, who I, I mentioned before who has her new music for new musicians program mm. she did a video on it and had featured three of her students playing, you know, the pieces that I wrote for them for that, for that series, cool. which is great and fantastic. And uh-huh. uh, we got to hear about different programs that people are doing during pandemic. Uh, I think it was Catherine Woodard had Sonic Crossroads, where she has uh, done a grading system for her students because, uh-huh. you know, that so a lot of the end of year recitals and competitions mm-hmm. didn't happen in 2020. Right. So a way to do them online virtually. Yeah. 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 And such. So that was exciting. And having the, the, of course the concert of, of women composers, historical and living is always nice. That's my favorite part of the, the music marathon is my favorite part of this festival mm-hmm. that usually just happens in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, for several years, it was at the charter Oak Center for the Arts, excuse me, and and last last couple of years it was at uh, Trinity College. Twenty twenty was supposed to be at the Hart School, which is where it was founded. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you know, yeah. So yeah, you raise another really good point, and that is that um, it's it's kind of hard, unfortunately, to find um, recordings of of music by women composers from the Baroque era or or before. You mm-hmm. know. Um, and so, so Hildegard von Bingen, like she was really popular for a while in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. So a yeah. Lot of, there was a lot of recordings then. Right. And but it, it's sort Barbara of... Strozzi is like becoming huge. And uh, Elizabeth de la Jacquet. Mm-hmm. Jacquet de la Guerre. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's been, um, you know, like little, little dribs and drabs, but, you know, mm-hmm. little by little. But um I look forward to when we can learn more about some of these women. It's not that they didn't exist. It's just that they didn't have the same kind of, you know, access to. And so many of them were nuns, too. So right. that music was, you know, in a cloistered archive somewhere. And, and so, Correct. you know, um, yeah. So I look forward to when we, you know, little by little kind of piece together more of that history of those women. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it really creates more of a timeline to the, you know, to the now. <laughs> Yes, very much so. Yeah. It's very exciting. And, it, and, uh, and then there's the people who are discovering things in their attics of, you know, women from the 1800s and, you know, that weren't permitted to get published because their husbands wouldn't allow it and, right. and whatnot. And right, right, right. Getting yeah. some of that music out of dank basements. and <laughs> I know. Before it gets, you know. Uh, completely ruined. It, it completely ruined and illegible. Exactly. So what are you most passionate about at this moment you know what are the things that really make you excited you know optimistic um, inspired happy what, whatever uh, pessimistic upset you know what are the things that really just kind of grab you right now in this moment at this very moment um i think that just being able to write music that people are playing you know I, for years i've been writing music that I occasionally could get friends of mine to play, which, you know, was great. Love Kulisma and Lisa and Carolyn because they put up with playing a lot of... I don't think we could do this. I think you can. Yeah, I think you, I think you could try. It's impossible. Maybe just try. 
uh, mm. kinds of things, yeah. you know, conversations. But now there are people who are outside of my circle of friends who are playing music, which is very exciting. I had Sarah Jeffries, who's in Amsterdam, play mm. two of my recorder pieces this past year, which is very exciting. So, so exciting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, I had a piece published by the American Recorder Society for their Play the Recorder Month. Oh. And so other people are playing playing music that I've written. And it's, I, I'm just very excited about all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. March and April 2020 is like my 15 minutes of fame, I guess, for yeah, my yeah. entire life. But well, I hope it lasts. Very exciting. I hope it lasts longer than 15 minutes. But like, so what can you share any kind of like um, projects you have on the horizon? Well, um, Ex, Ex Aequo, um, a, a guitar collective in New York, um, they commissioned a piece for me back in the end of 2019, which is supposed to be premiered, yeah, I think end of, end of May or early June. So that's going to be exciting. Oh, great. A guitar solo piece. And there was talk of, um, you know, sort of reshaping it maybe for student guitar work. So mm. I was tasked to make it to write a piece for a professional, but with the idea that it, it might be simplified in some way to be done for students. Um, so that's going to be exciting. I have some, in the end, I am actually going to be talking to students in schools yeah. in, um, I think, Arizona and in Virginia, my mm. old stomping grounds, wow. uh, about composing and what it's like to be a composer in a year of not leaving your friend's basement. <laughs> so. Wow. Well, well, I, I look forward to seeing, you know, what your what your next exciting project is. I have been speaking with Mel Fitzhugh. She is a composer, an innovator, a teacher, a multi-instrumentalist via Zoom about her remarkable life in music. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. <laughs>